I like the idea of doing, you know, before just asking permission, like the fact that the Bitcoin beach eventually inspired kind of the whole nation around itself. I think that that model clearly works well because one of the one of the big challenging things about Bitcoin is that like it's actually one of the most acceptable monies worldwide. Meaning, for example, like if I bring an Egyptian pound with me outside of Egypt, there's almost nothing I can do with it. Whereas Bitcoin, you can actually take it to cities around the world and you can actually uh, find ways to spend it or find someone to convert it for you uh, much easier than you ironically can with most fiat currencies. The global cryptocurrency market experienced a notable surge over the past day, with its value increasing by 3.17% to approximately $2.14 trillion. Bitcoin remains the dominant force, holding 56.03% of the market share. It's important to note that stablecoins continue to play a significant role, accounting for $60 billion in transactions, which makes up 92.43% of the 24-hour trading volume across the entire cryptocurrency market. Interestingly, Bitcoin itself saw a remarkable 47% increase in trading volume, reaching $29.4 billion in the last day and boosting its market valuation to $1.2 trillion. This surge in Bitcoin's trading volume reflects its growing prominence and volatility, a topic explored by Lynn Alden in a recent podcast with Ben. Alden discussed how Bitcoin's adoption is spreading, not just among individuals, but within entire communities. She emphasized the significance of integrating financial tools with communication networks, highlighting Bitcoin's increasing utility on a broader scale. While Alden doesn't foresee a strategic reserve for Bitcoin being established in the immediate future, she remains open to the idea, suggesting it could further enhance Bitcoin's ecosystem and drive wider acceptance. She also pointed out that Bitcoin is more likely to gain traction among decision makers in smaller companies or nations, where there is the ability to act quickly, potentially leading to significant price surges as adoption grows. I think, um, I mean, if... Like if you go to like a gold conference, it'll lean right as well. I mean, kind of appreciation of hard money is it just for whatever reason tends to be more on the right. Maybe because if especially that small government type conservative, um, you know, the, the idea that you have money that's not issued by a state is attractive to them. Um, whereas that's generally less kind of foundational and for a lot of parts of the left. There are obviously some parts of the left that, that like that. Um, I also think the environmental uh, FUD over years probably played a role there at least in, in the united states the the democratic party cares more about that topic um and so the, the fact that for many people they viewed as like energy energy guzzling inefficient uh they clung on to that narrative and then people when they say something publicly it's hard to then pivot from it if they had you know previously believed all that research was real and was like oh look you know it's really bad spoiling the oceans uh, it's hard to walk that back so i think it, it just takes time uh, to, to, you know, get a little bit more embraced. One of the things I said on another podcast recently was that um, the fact that politicians are sitting there discussing a strategic reserve for Bitcoin is great because it means they're not doing other things about Bitcoin. They're not like they're not, um, you know, figuring out how to block it or how to go after Bitcoiners. Unfortunately, there still is um, privacy issues that, that like, you know, some of their like not the politicians themselves, but like just deeper in you know, like like their their Department of Justice and stuff goes after people uh, just for kind of seeking privacy. But on the on the political level, at least the fact that they're all talking about that is great because it just gives more time for the ecosystem to keep building. So I don't really care too much if they end up doing a strategic reserve in the next few years. I think it's I would lean toward probably not that likely, um, but I am glad that that's what they're focusing on. One thing we've kind of seen is that whether it's companies or countries, um, when there's a kind of a small number of decision makers that can just do something in a normal publicly traded company, even the CEO is not like, they don't own a big share of the company. They're mostly caring about their, like, you know, their stock options and things like that. Um, whereas like in say MicroStrategy's case, the actual founder was, was still the CEO, uh, and obviously owns a big percentage of the company. So can think 10 years ahead and can, and can put significant changes in. Um, that's why I've seen a lot of small businesses have adopted Bitcoin because, you know, only one or a few key deciders. Um, and then when you go to, you know, using El Salvador as an example, um, or Kingdom of Bhutan or Switzerland, uh, some of these smaller countries, whether they're impoverished or whether they're wealthy, um, the fact that they're just not super big, they kind of have a, a 
easier time getting through red tape and actually making a decision on something. Uh, and that, that seems to be a pattern that, that, that is playing out so far, which makes sense. Why are you bullish? Uh, so I'm bullish uh, because of the launch of Fetty, um, the the kind of the the, the main launch. Uh, it's been in, in beta mode for a while. Um, EgoDeath is an investor in it, but just literally as a, like I use it too. Like um, I'm excited for it because uh, it, it, going back to my prior point around all these different communities, it really helps when they have tools that they can custody things locally instead of say put all their coins in like a big global exchange like Binance or something. Like wherever possible, you want those coins local, um, and uh, the fact that they have built-in privacy, I think, is a really big deal. Um, the fact that they can add other things to it, like data storage or compute, um, kind of like a whole super app is how they they put it. Basically, I think that that's it's it's really useful for scaling. And one of the things that also showed me early on, and Nostra reinforced it, is the importance of having communication. Uh, w with your wallet kind of like built in is super helpful um, because, you know, as, as you one way of putting it is that all commerce is basically inf you're exchanging information and you're exchanging money. Um, and so having both of those in the same uh, app is really useful. So, for example, Fetty has, you know, in internal chats that you can do and you can attach money to your chats or request money in the chats. Speaking about how Bitcoin is becoming increasingly popular in many communities, like aid organizations, Lynn Alden talked about how it may be useful in difficult situations. She emphasized the value of products like Noster, which combine money and communication to empower communities. The effectiveness of community-driven adoption was demonstrated by Alden's reference to the success of Bitcoin Beach, which led a country to accept Bitcoin. Alden stressed that rather than chasing after approval or getting sucked into the chaos, the real goal should be to grow and educate. According to Alden, the widespread formation of dense hubs that facilitate the spending and conversion of Bitcoin has led to the evolution of the cryptocurrency from individual acceptance to community-level growth. She sees this as a major turning point for Bitcoin's adoption and usefulness. Let's go back to the interview and watch more clips to gain insights from Lynn Alden. One of the things I found interesting is that on, on Noster, for example, amid all that communication, I think of sats and unit of account. So normally we, we focus on it as you know it's, it's either store of value or medium of exchange unit of accounts kind of the later thing uh, because it's, it's still volatile so most people don't uh, think heavily in terms of unit of account but on Noster it's like you get a, a thousand sats on your like post or something um, or you're giving out sats I always just think of that number I don't I don't like my mind doesn't even try to convert it to USD um, it's just like that's the that's the tipping environment on Noster and I think of it purely in, in Bitcoin terms. Um, and so that that kind of set of things is what I find really bullish. The fact that um, tools are coming out that empower these communities and that tie money and communication uh, together uh, in, in a really good way. One thing that I've kind of come to learn is that a, a lot of these aid organizations actually do use Bitcoin uh, because when they're moving money around, often in, in challenging environments, basically environments that need aid, they often don't have the best infrastructure or there's other frictions. Um, and so sometimes they do turn to Bitcoin and they don't necessarily publicize that fact because some of their donors might have bad, bad perceptions around Bitcoin. Um, and, you know, they might think it's bad for the environment. Or they might just, you know, whatever the whatever the FUD is. Um, so the fact that they're just quietly using it for its utility is um, like a really big deal. And tools like this or other tools, anything that can make it easier for them to do what they're trying to do, uh, I, I think that that increases the odds that they'll actually use it. And the more like embedded it can be in all these different organizations and all these different countries, um, the, the better it is, the more resistant it is to attack, um, you know, when it's kind of like entrenched in a lot of people's, you know, daily lives and businesses and aid organizations. I like the idea of doing, you know, before just asking permission, like the fact that the Bitcoin beach eventually inspired kind of the whole nation around itself. I think that that model clearly works well. Um, and when a community shows like a tool is working for them, uh, you know, eventually it's possible to get the government on your side, potentially. Uh, depends on, obviously depends on the on the government in question. Um, but it, if it's entrenched enough and it's, it's, it's providing value to the country, uh, and it changes their incentive calculus about wanting to support it rather than 
um, oppose it. I think my final thoughts, like my takeaway from this is that um, Bitcoin has kind of graduated to the community level. So, you know, in, in the early days, it was like a bunch of individuals. Um, and like you mentioned, a lot of times they didn't even meet other other Bitcoiners. Um, and now that like the network is 15 years in, it's at a bigger scale, there's starting to be more dense communities building around it. And it's still that same kind of bottom up um, uh, kind of direction. Uh, except it's on a bigger level. Um, and and I guess the recommendation to go along with that is try some of those tools, whether it's Fetty, whether it's Noster clients, whether it's Orange Pill Lab, anything that kind of has communication and money kind of built together, um, either online or in a local community or both. Um, I think that's that's really where the level is now. I just think those tools are super useful. I think the whole vibe of that whole kind of, um, you know, every every country is going to have multiple little hubs. Because um, one of the one of the big challenging things about Bitcoin is that like, it's actually one of the most acceptable monies worldwide. Meaning, for example, like if I bring an Egyptian pound with me outside of Egypt, there's almost nothing I can do with it. Whereas Bitcoin, you can actually take it to cities around the world, and you can actually uh, find ways to spend it or find someone to convert it for you. Uh, much easier than you ironically can with most fiat currencies. But it, until somewhat recently, there hasn't been these dense areas. Like in, in Egypt, the Egyptian pound is super u- liquid in Egypt. Uh, you can just, you know, it, it's very easy to obviously spend with it there. And Bitcoin has kind of lacked that. Um, but as these little communities um, build up um, and there's like more density in one spot, kind of, where you can actually like reliably spend it. Um, that's that's really powerful. And I think that it's the fact that that's kind of materializing is a big deal. On Tuesday, Bitcoin and Ether saw significant price increases, with Bitcoin surging nearly 4% to $60,842 and Ether rising by 1.7% to $2,664. This spike is largely attributed to expectations that the Federal Reserve might hint at a potential rate reduction later this week. Investors are eagerly awaiting the minutes from the Federal Reserve's July meeting and Fed Chair Jerome Powell's address at the Jackson Hole Symposium, both of which could provide crucial insights into the U.S. rate outlook and influence the direction of the cryptocurrency market. Other major cryptocurrencies, including BNB, Solana, XRP, Dogecoin, Tron, and Avalanche, also experienced gains ranging from 2.7% to 7%, reflecting a broader upswing in the crypto market. The CoinDCX research team has identified $58,556,000 as key support levels for Bitcoin, suggesting that the upcoming events could introduce significant market volatility. On the upside, resistance levels are projected at 63,500, 65,500, and 67,000 dollars. The team also pointed out that the Jackson Hole Symposium particularly Powell's speech on August 23rd, could be a catalyst for market fluctuations. Expectations are mounting that Fed policymakers might adopt a more dovish stance, potentially easing interest rates in September, which has contributed to a weakening dollar, with the dollar index hitting its lowest level since early January. In this context, Lynn Olden has offered insights into the political and ideological dimensions of Bitcoin's growing adoption. She noted that Bitcoin conferences often lean right-wing, likely because of the appreciation for hard money and minimal government interference. Alden also highlighted the environmental concerns associated with Bitcoin, which have shaped the perception of the cryptocurrency, particularly among Democrats in the US. Interestingly, she pointed out that when politicians begin discussing a strategic reserve for Bitcoin, it suggests they are not intent on hindering or resisting its adoption. This growing acceptance and the potential introduction of new financial tools could play a pivotal role in Bitcoin's future trajectory. What are your thoughts on Bitcoin's expanding influence? Please drop your thoughts in the comments below. Share this video and hit your thumbs on the like button. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe.